Right, Apollo 11 put a human on the moon, but it was Apollo 7 that convinced us that humans could even maneuver in space. On October 11th, 1968, the first manned spacecraft launched from Cape Kennedy, Florida. The world watched in awe, not really knowing what would come next. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, we have ignition. Commit liftoff, we have liftoff. This is launch control. We have cleared the tower. Right, the tower clear. Got a good view of it there with our long range camera. Wally Sharon, Don Isley, Walter Cunningham, the latter two making their first space flight. Look at the flame 700 gallons of RP 1 and liquid oxidizer burning up there every second gives me chills. Okay, our first guest was a lunar module pilot on that history-making flight into orbit. Please welcome crew member of the Apollo 7 mission, Colonel Walter Cunningham. Uh, wow. Well, okay, before we get to that, when you see that, do you still get chills watching that? Well, I think it's uh, hard for the public today to understand that I get more of a chill watching that today than I ever did then. Yeah. They have a hard time understanding that we were all focused on just making sure that we did the job and it was going to be successful. Yeah. And uh, only in the last 15 or 20 years have I gotten to the point where I, where I realized uh, we should have been thinking about something a little bit more iffy. <laughs> All right, we're going to go back uh, a ways. Uh, you grew up in Iowa, big open sky. Were you the kind of kid who looked up into the sky and thought, what if we could go there someday? Did it ever occur to you? Back in those days, 55, well, that was, boy, almost 90 years ago. Mm. I don't think that many people thought too much about that. And uh, as a matter of fact, the first time I remember thinking about me going into space, was when I was working on my doctorate in physics, working part-time, driving to work, and uh, Alan Shepard was, I was listening to the countdown and he lifted off, and. Uh, you were a little jealous, weren't you? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I was, a, I was a fighter pilot and doing a lot of flying, and I, of course I figured I was the best in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but I looked at that, and I do remember hollering out, I didn't know at the time, I didn't think of it, but later I realized you lucky SOB. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you got a call from NASA, or how did they let you know that they wanted to select you for uh, uh, the astronaut program? Well, they didn't uh, do that. About, uh, oh, a few. Yeah, there were no cell phones back then, yeah. so they didn't call you, right? <laughs> a year and a half later, actually, uh, I was at the stage where I, it was appropriate for me then. I was working at the Rand Corporation, and I remember then uh, I decided I was going to apply and uh, was flying with the reserves so I was busy pretty much that summer but uh, every couple of weeks I'd get a call saying hey I was in the in the running and did I well, did I still want to be a astronaut and I says yes because in those days among pilots and they, that was the first year they'd cut out having to have gone through the test pilot school so we all were looking forward to getting down there uh, so I felt very fortunate. That was the third group they'd selected, and it was the first time they'd accepted people that had not been through uh, test pilot school. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I've talked to several people who were, were part of the space program, and what they said was when they told their family in the beginning, I'm going to go work for this thing called NASA, they're like, you're crazy. This is trickery. Are you crazy? This is crazy. So we're kind of two, two schools of thought there. One was, this is crazy, and the other was, this is where we need to go, the, the adventurous side of people. Well, that side uh, is not not quite the same as it was today. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those days, we all believed in sticking our neck out. We were all fighter pilots. We all, we all thought that we could survive whatever was coming up, but we also knew there was an area that you might not. But when well, it came- uh, Apollo 1, you had the, the, the fire. We've seen other situations. Uh, you were assigned to Apollo 2, but they postponed some things. And then they said, all right, Apollo 7, the first manned flight. Tell us what that moment is like when they're saying five, four, three, two, one, and you're lifting off. Well, I have to tell you that on that uh, situation you just described there, 
we were originally, Wally, Don, and I, we were originally on the Apollo 2 crew. Mm -hmm. And we were still uh, going through construction and testing in the spacecraft to get ready for it. And so you had Gus, Gus uh, Ed, and Roger were doing the, prime, the Apollo 1 crew. We were the Apollo 2 crew. And as all the delays started coming, getting built in, they canceled our mission after about eight months. And when they canceled our mission, then we became the backup crew because our, our vehicle was the same as, as the Apollo 1 crew. So then we became the backup crew for Apollo 1. And of course, well, about three or four months later, uh, the Apollo 1 crew died in that fire on the pad. We had done a similar test the night before and had, it hadn't happened. So it was kind of a, 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 a originally a little puzzling yeah. on that. And a couple weeks later, then we inherited the first mission, but it was more sensibly numbered at the time, Apollo 7. Yeah. And uh, so for, for liftoff, something that most of us obviously will yeah. never experience. Well, we, uh, of course, we missed our friends, uh, our squadron mates, uh, but at the same time, we were very, very glad and excited that we were going to fly the first yeah. mission. And yeah. 20 months later, we finally were able to lift off. Yeah. We made about a thousand changes. Was it, was it everything you thought it would be to actually lift off? <laughs> you know, that's something that I I notice in here today. I don't remember having any thoughts like that back then yeah. because we all, rightly or wrongly, we all expected to do uh, well. Yeah. And we all were going to make sure that if anything happened negative about that mission, that it wasn't going to be due to me. Yeah. Uh, and if something uh, did, you learned from it, and the next one stepped up, and you all moved on. Uh, you said the first live TV space transmissions. You actually uh, got an Emmy Award for that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like that a category, space category, where you're like you're up against I Dream of Genie or something like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I have to tell you, it really is kind of interesting because w when we got back after the eleven day mission, and the, the mission was there's a lot of debatable things. You ought to go read about it. <laughs> but the, the mission itself <laughs> worked it out very well uh, on that. And when it came to the, that Emmy, that was, a, that was kind of our biggest shock because we had to do some television from space. What people today don't realize, we only had air-to-ground communications about 4.5% of the time. Yeah. So here we, we were doing this, and after we got back, we found out that somebody had, they had made an Emmy. Yeah. For yeah. Us. <laughs> All right, I want to. But, but we didn't even get to go collect it. You didn't get to go collect it? Did they no. send it to you? Well, NASA wouldn't let us go collect it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Consider it a gift? Okay, I have, I have some extra. I'll let you have one of mine. All right, uh, I, I want you to finish this sentence. We can send a man to the moon, but we still can't. Boy, you're going to make me go to work here on that one. <laughs> okay. I think with a PhD in physics, I think you can figure something no, out. We can send a man to the moon. I have to tell you. Uh, sending a man to the moon was important 50 years ago because it was a moving technology back, moving it out, and all the things we developed were still benefiting from the technology we had to develop to do that. Right. Now, we don't have as critical uh, uh, of an audience that people that are on the outside, and they talk about, you know, we even have one guy, you know, I think it was Elon Musk was talking about landing in 2024 with uh, at least a thousand people on on Mars. Yeah. The public today has got to get more realistic about going about these things. Uh, we we may very well get back to the moon. That makes some sense because you need to develop technology. You might eventually go go to Mars. But I have to tell you, right now, we know so much more about Mars than we ever knew about the moon hmm. 50 years ago. Yeah. So. Uh, you're not going to have quite as good an excuse to go to go to Mars. Yeah. All right. Um, then the next question is, are we the only ones? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to pass this test? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's interesting. I was, I was interviewing the crew uh, that went to fix the, the Hubble Space Telescope, right? And he said, when he got up into space and he turned and he looked at Earth, he said it was the most magnificent, beautiful thing he had ever seen. And he thought to himself, there could only be one. And then he turned another direction and saw the vastness of space and said, oh, no, there's got to be a whole lot more. <laughs> right? Well, with millions and millions of objects out there, it's, it, it's 
let's say, probable that there's other facilities that have developed some kind of, I, I hesitate to even call it humans, yeah. because we are the way we are today, mental, physical, and what have you, because of the properties on the planet yeah. that we are on. Now, I think it'd be ridiculous to think that there is no life in any of the millions and billions of other planets that are out there. At the same time, uh, I can't put my finger on anything positive on a particular You, you haven't seen anything while you were out there. I get what you're saying. No. Um, <laughs> Colonel Cunningham, we want to thank you so much for being here. And you've written the book, The All-American Boys, which, yeah. which details a lot of what, what you all, the behind the scenes type of stuff. But thank you so much for coming in this morning. My son, on his summer break, and his friend, yes. uh, Cooper, would never get up early for anything. And he was like, you're having an astronaut on tomorrow? So they got up and came in this morning. Thank you for thank getting you. up and coming I, in this morning. I need to add one thought. Okay. <clears throat> I need to add the thought that, that my book, The All-American Boys, is still selling 42 years after I wrote it. Wow, because it's so. still a great story. Yeah. To learn more about Colonel Cunningham, Apollo 7, or NASA's space program, you can log on to greatdayhouston.com for links.